All right. Welcome everyone and thank you for being here this afternoon for this important conversation about inclusion at the Dude. We have an outstanding panel and moderator lined up for today, which we'll kick off in just a few minutes. But before we do that, I'd like to share a story with you. In, you know, National Coming Out Day was founded in 1988, and it was founded on the basic belief that homophobia thrives in an atmosphere of silence and ignorance. And that once folks know people in their lives who are lesbian and gay, they are far less likely to maintain homophobic views. In 1997, Ellen came out on the cover of Time Magazine, and about, I came out about seven years later in 2004, and am coming out again here today to, to the Dude Nation. This is something, this is not something that I ever thought that I would do, and it's not because I live my life in the closet, but because I look forward to a day when coming out isn't a thing. If we all kind of think of ourselves as a 2,500 piece puzzle, our sexual orientation, our gender identity, and our gender expression are just three of those pieces. We have so many identities beyond those three things that make up who we are as individuals. But then I attended a pride talk in June with Stan Kimmer, who's joining us on the panel today. During that conversation, I found myself in pretty, feeling pretty inspired Somebody asked Stan, what can the dude do to improve LGBTQ inclusion at our company? And Stan responded that having out members of the leadership team is one of the most effective ways to create this inclusion. It's important that LGBTQ employees can see a path to the leadership team level that isn't precluded by their being a member of the LGBT community. As I was sitting there in community commons and, and listening to that response and listening to the talk as a whole, I found myself um, thinking about my own career. And I thought back to a company that I worked at earlier in my career that was pretty conservative and it wasn't very diverse and it didn't feel safe to be out at that company. And then I thought about my time with RegEd and the outstanding example of out leadership that was provided by our CEO who is also joining us on the panel today. Once I realized what a difference out leadership made for me, I felt compelled to do, the, do what we're doing today and come out at the dude in the case or in the event that it's helpful to L other folks here who are members of the LGBTQ community. So in that moment of inspiration, I spoke to Pam and committed to today's event. That was in June. Let's fast forward to October. Um, last week, as I started preparing for the event, I realized pretty quickly that I am not well informed on the issues. And I really don't know much beyond my own experiences. And I sort of took a step back and thought to myself, you know, how will, how will I stand up here and sort of lead this initiative if I really don't know what I'm talking about? So I set out to replace my own ignorance with knowledge. And wow, did I learn a lot in the last week. If, as I looked over the research, it felt like I was putting numbers to some of my, the experiences that I've had in my life and in my career. And with that, I'd like to share with you a little bit about what I learned to lay a foundation for the conversation that we're gonna have today. So here's what I've learned so far. 46% of LGBTQ workers are closeted at work. And this is actually a big improvement in 2018 from some of the other studies that were done in 2012 and earlier. Beyond being closeted, about 20% of LGBT employees avoided a special event such as a lunch or a holiday party or a happy hour. 25% avoid certain people at work. And 20% feel that they have been passed over for job opportunities because they are LGBTQ. It's interesting that so many folks of the LGBT community are in the closet when you look at this next statistic which says that 80% of non-LGBTQ workers feel that LGBTQ workers should not have to hide who they are at work. I'm gonna say that acronym a lot today. <laughs> um, but while 80% are saying that folks shouldn't have to hide who they are, 36% are saying that they would feel uncomfortable hearing an LGBTQ employee talk about dating at work. 
59% think it's unprofessional to discuss sexual orientation and gender identity. So it's sort of this mixed message to folks. Um, yeah, you should be able to be who you are, but don't talk about it. Um, and I think what we sometimes fail to recognize is that we all have a sexual orientation, a gender identity, and a gender expression. Even if you identify as straight, or if you identify with the gender that you were born with, that's still your identity when you think about those characteristics. So, you, so some only feel you know, that it's a problem when it's LGBTQ folks who are discussing it. So why might LGBT workers feel the need to be closeted? A couple of reasons, 20% each year report that they experience discrimination at work. One in five LGBTQ workers have been told that they need to dress more feminine or masculine compared to one in 24 non-LGBTQ workers. You can probably imagine that I've heard this one a few times in my career. <laughs> in fact, if I had a dollar for every time I heard it, I wouldn't have to work anymore. 53% of LGBTQ plus workers report hearing jokes about lesbian or gay people at work while only 37% of their non-LGBTQ counterparts report hearing the same. So in an unwelcoming workplace, what are the consequences? Well, 25% of LGBTQ workers feel distracted, so that's a hit to productivity. 28% feel that they need to lie about their personal life. That makes it really difficult to identify with an integrity core value and to connect with people in a real way when you're sharing stories and experiences. 17% feel exhausted from spending energy hiding who they are. And 31% feel unhappy or depressed at work. So it really becomes a quality of life issue when you start to get into that number. One in five LGBTQ workers will search for a different job in an unwelcoming environment and one in 10 will leave when the environment isn't accepting of LGBTQ people. It's no secret that we need people to, to do what we do here every day. And we need people to get in the chairs and stay in the chairs. So when you think about the cost of replacing an employee, it can be up to 20% of the total compensation for an entry level employee. And it can go all the way up to 300% if you're replacing a senior executive. And when you think of sales and ramp time, things of that nature, that hit becomes even more meaningful to our revenue numbers. So what does this mean for us here at The Dude? Well, research shows that employees who conceal their LGBTQ identity can spend up to 20% of their productivity doing so. So we've got about 650 folks here that are part of Dude Nation. If you look at that against 4.5% of the US population that identifies as LGBTQ, that means we probably have, give or take, around 29 or 30 dudes who identify as member of the LGBTQ community. When you take those 29 dudes and you look at it against 20%, we're looking at 5.85 years of productivity that we can gain in a single year by creating an inclusive environment. Now, I don't know about all of you, but I think that there's not a team in this building who wouldn't like to claim almost six years of productivity to be able to add to their mission and what we need to achieve on a day-to-day -day basis. So how can we build a more inclusive culture at The Dude? Well, one of the things that we can do is to really show up with intent and be purposeful about building this environment. And to do that, I'd like to you know, share an exciting announcement. We are going to launch The Dude's first employee resource group it will be the Pride Resource Group name pending once we get the, the team together. We'll see if we want to switch names. But I think this is pretty exciting. Um, you know, I want to stress that this will be not the only employee resource group, but just the first. In speaking to Hannah, there's also a great deal of interest around creating employee resource groups for women, uh, for our remote workers, and also for veterans. And I'm sure that more interest will come to the surface in addition to those three. For anyone who doesn't know what an LGBT, or excuse me, what an employee resource group is, these are employee-led groups that basically come together around any identifying characteristic, and they exist to offer network, offer opportunities to network internally. They help attract a diverse talent base. They can provide the inclusion of ideas and solution with different thought perspectives, and create opportunities for mentoring and career development. 
When we think about the pride resource group, and this will evolve over time, but there's a couple of obje objectives out of the gate. The first is we'd really like to foster an inclusive work environment that inspires all dudes to bring their best, to do the best work of their lives and be able to bring their whole selves to work. We'll be able to provide advice, guidance, and recommendations to HR and senior leadership on workplace policies that relate to the LGBTQ community. And we can also serve as a support network here within the DUDE for LGBTQ members and allies, ensuring that everyone has the opportunity to develop and succeed. And last but certainly not least, we'll be having and <clears throat> hosting recruitment initiatives so that we can bring in top talent from the LGBTQ community as well. I'd like to kind of set this goal for the, the Pride Resource Group. And by the way, it's a group of one right now. So there, there will be a recruiting message with this as well. Um, but I'd like to set a goal that by 2022, we, get, we earn a 100% rating on the Corporate Equality Index. The Corporate Equality Index is an annual survey and assessment that's run by the Human Rights Campaign. And it's based on a couple of criteria about equal benefits, equal treatment, training and how we support our managers and our leaders to understand and recognize issues. And if we achieve this, we'll actually be able to take this logo and put it on our website, put it on our recruiting materials, et cetera, and let every member of the LGBTQ community know that this is a great place to come and work. 2022 is the goal. I'd love to do it in 2021. Anyone who's interested in helping this goal, please you know, join the group, come talk to me. Um, I think this will be something really great to work towards. I also want to talk a little bit about how the Pride Resource Group will align with our mission and values. We're here to employ, uh, empower our clients and our employees to do the best work of their lives. LGBTQ employees can do that when they feel comfortable and safe bringing their whole self to work. In terms of service, we can bring out the best in each other and in turn better serve our clients by building an inclusive environment. With ingenuity, studies by Accenture have shown that LGBTQ employees' innovation mindset, which is the ability and the willingness to innovate, is seven times higher in the most equal cultures compared to the least equal ones. Integrity, if folks don't have to hide, they can be their whole selves. They're not lying by omission. They're not, not disclosing parts of their lives out of fear. And together, you know, building an inclusive environment that also helps build trust which in turn leads to collaboration and some pretty transformative work that can take place here. So keep your eyes out, please. More information will be coming soon on how to get involved with the Pride Resource Group. I also wanna stress that this is not only for members of the LGBT community, but for allies as well, because we cannot achieve what we're going to try to achieve here without the support of allies. So please don't um, think that you're not welcome in this group if you don't identify with the LGBTQ community. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ed as our moderator, and we will jump right into the panel discussion. Nicole, um, I've lived a pretty vanilla life my entire life, and um, I would call that a moment of courage for you. Well done. Honored uh, to be here as moderator uh, for this panel. It's important. Uh, the dude, uh, I want the dude to be one of the most welcoming places uh, in the face of the planet uh, as an employer. And this uh, initiative and um, effort uh, around this and other uh, committees uh, is just an example of that. And as Humans and people, we ought to all get behind this. We want the best talent in the building, uh, no matter what the configuration of human is at that point. So I have been uh, given some questions to sort of kick off the moderation piece. Uh, if we run out of questions before we run out of time, uh, we'll obviously open up the floor uh, for some Q&A. So, seeing as how we're together this afternoon to recognize National Coming Out Day, which is a day to celebrate coming out, raise awareness for the LGBTQ plus community, and to discourage an atmosphere of silence and ignorance. I, I'd like to ask uh, uh, our panelists to share uh, your moment of courage uh, when you came out uh, 
um, whether it's at work or, or other places. Great. Uh, I'm, again, I'm Stan Kimmer, and I worked at IBM for 31 years. And uh, I actually came out to myself in about 1993, but I wasn't out uh, at work. Uh, and I maybe was out to maybe two or three friends. And in 1993, things were not as uh, friendly as they are today. In 1996, IBM announced domestic partner benefits. And uh, late that Friday afternoon, uh, a reporter who got my name from someone called me up and said, can you find someone at IBM who's out and gay who would do an interview about what this means to them? It was late Friday afternoon. I knew no one else would be in. I was officially press trained by IBM. So I said, I guess I might as well do it myself. And then the next day in the business section of the News and Observer, the first, you know, the headline story was about IBM domestic partner benefits. And the first sentence was a quote by me. So I kind of came out publicly all at once. And so sometimes the purpose of this story is that sometimes the perfect opportunity to come out, you know, unveils itself and you just need to grab it at the time and go for it. You know, we're going to do something. Your, your moderator um, missed a very important step, and that's to introduce our, our, dang, mo uh, our dang panel. <laughs> so that was Stan. Um, nationally recognized consultant and speaker on all areas of workplace diversity with deep expertise in LGBT diversity. He's trained or spoken in over 75 venues, reaching nearly uh, 5,000 professionals. For four years, Stan served as IBM's corporate global LGBT diversity manager, where he expanded initiatives globally and advanced support for transgender employees. Stan holds a bachelor's degree from Georgia Tech and an MBA from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. And in his spare time, trains as a competitive adult figure skater. Stan, thanks for being here. Uh, next up, Laura King. Laura came to the Dude a year ago, lending her sales experience to our SmartGov team. She is a fierce LGBTQ plus ally, which began with an unwavering support of her sister who came out in a conservative evangelical family in the 80s and has since evolved into a dedicated advocacy and sis involved into dedicated advocacy and activism. Laura has three children and is a proud LGBTQ plus mom to her child, uh, Ellie, Eli, Eli. In her spare time, Laura enjoys singing jazz, rock, and R&B, taking ballroom dancing lessons, fishing with her husband, and she hopes to get back into music theater next year. John, Schobel is the founder and CEO of RegEd, which is HQ just down the road in Morrisville, and, is, and they are the market leading provider of RegTech enterprise solutions, enabling firms in the financial service industries to optimize compliance, manage risk, and enable growth. John is a passionate supporter of promoting financial literacy for underserved communities. He holds a bachelor's degree from NYU and a law degree from Washington University in St. Louis. In his spare time, John enjoys traveling and spending time with his husband and daughter, Patsy, who recently celebrated her 18th, 18th, 18th month birthday. <laughs> it's been a long 36 hours. Um, um, not enough coffee yet. Uh, Nicole Clem, you know Nicole, joined the Dude in May of 17 after working with John at Reg Ed. For over five years, she leads our Office of Growth Initiatives, serves as a member of our senior leadership team, in 2016, Nicole joined DUDE's uh, Diversity and Inclusion Committee and will serve as the executive sponsor of our Pride Resource Group. She's passionate about building an inclusive culture and fostering equality for all DUDEs. Nicole holds a bachelor's degree from Hofstra and an MBA from St. John's University in New York. In her spare time, she enjoys traveling the East Coast to spend, with her, spend time with her eight nieces and nephews who are affectionately known as Aunt Cole's Toddler Army. Alrighty then. Now back to the originally scheduled question and I'll repeat it because I forgot what it was in the first place, let alone you guys. Uh, uh, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to share their own coming out uh, experience with us. And uh, you heard Stan's and uh, who wants to go next? Yeah, I'll go next. Um, thank you. Thank you for that great introduction. You kind of heard my coming out story because I went to NYU. 
and it, and let's face it, like in you know, and I realized I I truly realized what an opportunity and privilege that was, especially back in the late '80s when I went, and I remember being a scared high school kid reading a book by Irma Bombeck about the Insider's Guide to College, and none of you, or maybe some of you, gray hairs will know Irma Bombeck, but she, she I remember her writing. And everything, everyone at NYU is gay. I was like, oh, I think I'll just go there then. That's fine. So I went, <laughs> so I went to NYU and indeed everyone was gay. How great. So that helped in terms of coming out. But, it's, but I also read something later on in life, which, I, which has always stuck with me. Maybe I read it early is that you never stop coming out. It never ends. And I feel as though I come out all the time. I just come out in very different contexts. I come out, I'm coming out here to many people that don't know me, right? I come out to employees when I reference my husband or my daughter. I come out every week, sometimes multiple weeks in business conversations because people want to talk about their families and I have a family and people want to talk about your personal life and you can't build a genuine relationship when you are hiding part of yourself. And so coming out is not, there's, it, it's, I love that there's a day for it, but for a person in our community, there never isn't a day and you always have to come out. So, you know, it, it, does it get a little easier as you go through life and you, you know, amass security that comes from moving through life? Sure. But for the people that Nicole described early in the presentation, where she mentioned people that don't have as much agency in their life, and are in difficult work situations where their employers are not like where we are, then you know what, it's, it, it's, it's painful and it, and it never ends. And those are the people that we have to continue to come out for and continue to have this conversation for. Hi, I'm Laura. Um, I guess my, my coming out story is a little, gonna be a little bit different. <laughs> I'm a parent and a sis sister, um, an aunt to a, a couple of different, um, Queer folks, um, I think the the important coming out was going against my family to support my sister um, in the late '80s. It was a really difficult challenge. Um, it took us both away from our church family as well, which was our basic infrastructure for our entire lives. So it was it was an emotional time um, for both of us. But I would not leave her side and I still won't. Um, I feel the same way about my kid. I feel the same way about my friends and I, I feel the same way about coming out all the time. I feel like just sitting up here today, a lot of my coworkers may not know that um, I have family that is dear to me that I fiercely and am loyally um, supporting on a day-to-day -day basis as they're seeking rights to just be employed and get housing and to make sure that they can have all the benefits that those of us that are cis have the opportunity to do. So what, what John said about coming out all the time really resonates with me. It, it is not a one-time event. Um, you know, I was at the doctor a few weeks ago and they're, they're doing the intake form where you're answering questions, are you a smoker, et cetera, et cetera. And instead of asking me what my sexual orientation was, the um, person who was doing the intake just said heterosexual. And I was like, no, thank you. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it's just those little moments where you never know. It, it does come up pretty routinely. In my experience, it gets each, easier each time. Um, but also in my experience, the hardest person that I've ever come out to has been myself. I grew up in a pretty small town. It's about 90 minutes outside of Manhattan, but about 90 years away in terms of being socially progressive. My family's also pretty conservative, and I can remember a lot of times growing up, them sharing viewpoints that made it pretty clear to me that they weren't going to be too, too savvy with, with this whole experience. Um, and in middle school, I remember as my friends started to become interested in, in boys and started plastering their bedrooms with posters of teen heartthrobs and boy bands and things of that nature. And I was thinking, like, why do we care about this? What's going on here? Um, so I sort of knew I wasn't interested in men, but it took me a while to, to figure everything else out. I, when I left home, I went to college and I went on a college softball scholarship. If you don't figure out that you're gay when you're playing college softball, you're never going to figure it out. 
so you know in this new world um i started to get really close to became close friends with my teammates a few of whom were gay and started to get more and more connected to that community and found myself pretty drawn to it and as i realized that i was gay um, i started to kind of struggle with a sense of shame almost growing up you're just sort of a lot of us are conditioned that a relationship or a marriage it really only exists between a, a man and a woman and that's not the case and I needed to reach a point for myself of, of self-acceptance and self-love. Right around that time, uh, Showtime released a show called The L Word, and it was pretty groundbreaking at the time. For anyone who's not familiar with the show, it's essentially sex in the city with gay women. Um, and I recommend watching it. In November of 2004, season one of that show came out on DVD. To this day, I can't tell you why, but I decided to skip class I was at Best Buy like when they unlocked the doors, which was not a time of day where I was typically out doing anything around 10 a.m. Um, and I went in, I bought, the, I bought the box set, I bought a DVD player, I went back to my room, started watching it. And that show, um, seeing an out group of gay women, even though it was just on TV, it really helped me start to picture a future. And I was like, you know what, this is gonna be okay. And that was sort of the experience that, that helped me accept myself. And to this day, when I watch that show, I still feel like I'm hanging out with friends, even though they have no idea who I am. <laughs> um, and I'll mention one more thing there. You know, that experience also really helped me understand the power of media. And I just wanna share with our marketing folks, I see Catherine sitting over there, so I'll, I'll share this with her, but you know, never forget how powerful you are and the positive influence that you can have with the stories that you tell. Um, cause that was something that was just a story that somebody told that made a really big difference in my life. Cool. Thank you. Um, I think what resonated, uh, most, uh, out of all these stories was the, the idea that it's not like a one-time, like event. This is a, a, a daily, monthly, weekly thing in, in a lot of folks' lives. So, uh, it takes a lot of courage. All right. Next question. Um, the uh, Human Rights Campaign Foundation's 2018 Workplace Climate Survey found that 46% of LGBTQ plus workers are closeted at work. I think that was a slide that uh, Nicole had thrown up there a little earlier. The top reasons for not being open at work include 38% noting the possibility of being stereotyped, 36 cited the possibility of making folks feel uncomfortable, 31% feared the possibility of losing connections or relationships with coworkers, and 27% um, reported worried uh, that people might think I'm attracted to them just because I'm LGBTQ+. How has being out impacted uh, any of your careers, and what unique challenges have you faced um, with, uh, it says brining here, by the way, bringing your whole self to work, <laughs> brining your whole self. That doesn't sound uh, pleasant at all. Um, bringing your whole self to work. I'm trying to remember the first part of the question. <laughs> how is, uh, uh, the, the, how yeah, has how the, been... uh, the, uh, the, uh, kind of the, the value of it and, and the unique challenges yes. you faced with bringing your whole self to and work. was the first part of the question? How the has being I'm, I'm impacted. impacted? Yeah. Well, yeah, it was interesting because, uh, you know, I came out, it was like public, then all of a sudden if I saw the newspaper and then Monday morning, you know, uh, uh, you know, my, my employees started coming and I was a manager and, uh, you know, one was this uh, saucy woman from Brazil. She gets in about 7.15 and she walks in my office and she goes, you got balls. <laughs> so, uh, and, every, and most people were real supportive, but I could, I could sense the managers and the people that were uncomfortable, like you know, my peer manager who would keep calling my partner my roommate instead of calling her my partner or my spouse. But for the most part, it was really good. And then I got to serve on panels like this because I was the highest out gay person at the IBM site at East Church Triangle Park. The diversity manager heard me speak on this, these panels a few times, the diversity director, and then he offered me the LGBT diversity management job for all IBM. So it ended up being something like really, really good in my career. And that was the most fun job I ever had when I was IBM's LGBT global diversity manager. So I was very fortunate to have a very positive environment. And probably the only uh, real challenge 
were, you know, those people that I felt were, you know, I could sense were a little bit uneasy uh, with me and, you know, damaging those working relationships. But for the most part, it was very rewarding. Sure, we're going to mix up the order. I don't know. Well, so the question is, what, how is it, how, how have I been impacted by coming out at work? Yeah, and what challenges, and what challenges? have you faced? So, uh, I mean, when I, when I really had my first career, I, I know, if, if looking back on this, that I chose it. It was in arts management and museum work in New York. Well, like NYU, everybody was gay. So I was not negatively impacted at all. What a huge surprise, right? But so it seemed as though until I was, you know, in my mid-20s, this is how it was. But yet I also knew, because I went back to the Midwest to go to law school and sort of reinvent myself, I knew there was another world out there. And when I was at law school, that became very clear when you're dealing with things like the Federalist Society and genuine heartland conservatism, it, 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 it is anathema to, to someone like me. And then I think in terms of how coming out continued to impact me, it did. And I mentioned before that I had a lot of agency, the, the business that I run was founded by my family. When I got there, I was like, dad, what's with all these gay guys that work here? Oh, they're the best at service. Okay, great, thanks. That's a terrible stereotype, but it was <laughs> fine. And it turns out to be true. But like, you know, it, 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 was, it was right away, it was, so, it was so obvious that I was in a world which is selling to enterprise banking, compliance officers, regulatory by nature, very, even software. These are not areas where out gay men particularly, but out gay people necessarily historically thrived, not in the 80s and 90s, and even in the early part of this century while I was doing it. I will say the world has changed and it has changed much more for the better. It's not just that I am out more or that I am just in a very safe place to be out as CEO, I am, it's extremely safe, but it is, it is also the case that we can have more conversations and, there's, and thanks to things like the L word, you can never, and Ellen, you can never minimize this, right? It, it, the impact of positive role models in media and in our society as a whole have, made, have, made, have had beneficial impact on all of our careers, I would say. And now I find myself in a world that is not particularly enveloping of gay people theoretically, except look at the change in posture by corporations that we're dealing with. Look at what you all are assembling here at Dude. Look at how IBM is decades ago started this where inclusion and diversity initiatives are an important part of it. So I think it's a, it's a great time for that. I have to just say one more thing and I hope I'm not overstepping my time. It's great in some ways, but because if we look, we cannot forget why this is so important. It is not a, it is not a grass is always greener situation. Yesterday, the Supreme Court argued before then that basically, you know, any out gay person should be able to be fired if he or she is involved in, in, in any way with a religious oriented business. And that's a very, very broad brush. And this, our entire, our entire, you know, the, the fates of many people ha who don't exist, who don't work in places like this or aren't the CEO and founder of, their, of a company that they work for, then you know what? They have a lot at risk. And this is all hanging on the text, a textual read by one very conservative man. And it's gonna, it, it's gonna be a really scary place if it all goes that way, so. I should have ended with something happier than that. Oh, and if Mike Pence becomes president, it's not gonna be so great either. <laughs> and what John was talking about yeah. is, is reality, because I have a close friend about a year ago who left a really good job to take a next, an, an even better job at a small agency of 25 people here in Raleigh. And uh, he came out uh, as gay on his first day of work. And because of that, he was fired on his second day of work. So things like this happen especially in the states that don't have protection. So it's really good that a lot of major corporations, including Dude Solutions, provides a safe workplace, even though the government does not. Okay, what was the question again? <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. How has it impacted oh. your career and what challenges have you faced with bringing your whole self to work? Okay, so this really doesn't apply to me. I mean, it does. It, it does. does it does. You have to be out as an ally because that's okay. 
<laughs> they just answered the question for me. No, seriously. I mean, you know, you don't, my child um, uses gender neutral pronouns. And when I talk about my kids, which is a lot, um, ask anyone that sits anywhere near me or in the general vicinity or on the same floor. <laughs> yeah, Amanda knows. Um, I don't always use the right pronouns and I do that purposefully because it gets confusing for them. And yet at the same time, I'm doing my own kid a disservice because that's not what they would prefer. And my first allegiance is to my kid, not necessarily to my coworkers. So I have to be coming out again um, and, and, taking the opportunity to share with other folks that don't understand pronouns and non-binary and fluidity of both sexual orientation and gender stuff. It, it's very, there's a lot to be considered. You know, we were talking about 30 years ago when my sister was coming out, um, it was you were gay or you were straight. And now there's this other layer that this new generation is bringing to be even more open and more true to themselves and more authentic and to have the opportunity to be on the right side of history again is just a really, really cool thing. So I'm, I'm really excited about the opportunity to, to talk about that a little bit more. So I, I sort of mentioned earlier, one of the, the companies I worked at earlier in my career, not feeling like a safe place. And I can remember early in my time with that company, I was out to lunch one day with a, a group of folks. And as John mentioned, you know, people at work, we talk about our families, we talk about what we did on the weekend. And you can't really connect with people if you're hiding a piece of yourself. So I'm sitting there at this lunch and folks are going around the table talking about their significant others. And I had this like panicked moment. You couldn't tell on my face, but in my mind, I was like, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna say? Um, and as it came to me, I did talk about my girlfriend, but I, at the time, but I, I found myself using they and them as pronouns. And it was not because I was savvy with preferred pronouns. Um, it was because I didn't feel comfortable being out. And it took, you know, a great deal of energy to do that. But beyond the energy, I was faced constantly with this choice between compromising my own principles, integrity being really important to me, and taking a risk with, with being honest with people and sharing who I am and having some potential backlash there. I found myself quite often lying by omission. Um, and it's, it's not a great feeling to have. As I moved on in my career, and I worked at more open companies and I just sort of in general became more confident and, and grew into myself more. I became, you know, very comfortable being out and looking back when I think of how I performed as an employee in those different environment examples, I've always done my best work and been at my peak performance when I've been in an environment that's welcoming because it allows me to take all of my energy and all of my brain power and put it into what we're trying to achieve instead of having this sort of like section of my brain blocked off that's ready to hide and hide my identity anytime one of these questions comes up. Um, so it really, it really took growing as a person and getting to that point. But I, I think some of the benefits in terms of how it's impacted my career, going through these kinds of experiences, you build mental toughness, you build resiliency, um, I've built empathy and compassion in areas of my life that maybe didn't come so naturally to me when I was younger. And it helps me now recognize when someone else is maybe going through a similar experience, whether they're LGBTQ or um, Black or a member of any other community who might feel uh, marginalized. And it lets me now stand up for those people if they maybe don't have the agency to, to stand up for themselves and be able to speak out if you hear an offhanded joke or if you just recognize that someone might need to talk and have a safe place to be open. So as challenging as, as, challenging as some of those experiences were, I'm thankful I've had them because it's built me into who I am today and it's put me in a good place to be able to help other people. Cool, thanks for sharing. 
Um, next question. Have you had an experience where an ally has been helpful or supportive at work or in your personal life? I had a wonderful, I was telling uh, Nicole this uh, the other day, I had, I had this wonderful manager at IBM uh, who you know, totally treated my relationship with my partner the same way as she did her married, uh, as, her mar as my married coworkers. And uh, we had a project where we had to work like 70 hours a week for about five weeks. And she realizes that impacts people's families when they're like that. So uh, I was taking my partner, Rich, out for dinner and she called my mother. She had my mother's phone number. My manager found out why, where I was taking Rich to dinner. And when we walked in, the host there uh, gave us a card uh, for Rich from Chris, my manager, who said, you know, thank you for uh, hanging in there with us during this busy time and supporting Stan drinks and dessert are on me. And it just spoke volumes to me that, you know, she realized that, you know, Rich was a part of my life and treated that with such respect. And, you know, she was the best manager I ever had and I would do anything for her, that she built such loyalty that I'll always go the extra mile, you know, for a manager like that. So, I'm sorry, what's the question again? <laughs> Have you had an experience where an ally has been helpful or supportive at work or in your personal life? Have you done that? As a manager. Oh, I don't know, probably. I, I mean, I hope so. I, um, but I would say that I, I, I think something that Nicole <laughs> said earlier is, is really important that, you know, if, we, if you are an ally, stand up. Um, and make yourself known because there are other other folks that are trying to be supportive and caring for our coworkers, um, for the people in our lives. Um, so I would say that yes, there have been other allies that have helped me through some difficult times. You know, over the years, um, when we talk about some of the issues that our loved ones are facing, but at the same rate, um, you know, I. I'm just so grateful to get the opportunity to learn about someone else's experience in the gay community and the queer community. So, and, and give them the opportunity to know, hey, I'm a safe place to talk. Yeah. I, I don't, you know, my, I've had so many that it could never, it can never end. I have one in the front row. I have all my colleagues and I, we have, Regat has about 250 full-time employees. And you know they all know that they have a, a out gay CEO, and they're all all of them that aren't queer are my ally, right? So, but that's just a tiny fraction. Every client that I have, thousands and thousands of them, could be could could be the same. The only thing I would caution though is, you know, it's still a world. Even though I presented, you know, I I realize again that I live in a I live in a in a, a bubble of of fortune and, and, and opportunity that I helped create for sure, but it exists, but it even impacts me, right? Like I can't, you know, if there's a client that I sense for whatever reason may not be an ally, I switch myself out really fast because I don't want to impact the business negatively. I was telling Deborah earlier that, you know, it, I even have to, I even, I even censor and edit myself in certain ways. I'm not the owner of the firm. I have, I have new owners. I have many employees that, that um, rely on my success and I have to edit myself, right? Like I didn't, you know, I, I, it's easy. I know, Ed, that you wrote a great email because someone was just telling me about it to your employee base. I would tend not to write that email. I constantly censor myself because I don't want to be, not that I don't want to be the gay CEO. I don't care if I'm the gay CEO, but I don't want to be, have that in any way through homopho institutionalized and other and, and overt homophobia come back to impact my business and my employees in any negative way. So this, the work we're talking about here never really stops and the opportunity to talk about it never really stops. And, you know, no matter who you are, you run the risk of facing homophobia. But fortunately, at least as I see it, the amount of allies and the amount of support in the world that we have is so much greater than it used to be that it gives me great hope.
So there was there was a night in November 2016, and it was I'm sure you all remember the the election. And I remember sort of sitting and watching the results come in, and and just sort of having this moment of disbelief, which is like, oh my God, this is this is happening. Um, and especially as a New Yorker, um, with Donald Trump being from New York, and I think New Yorkers kind of just have a familiarity with him that now the the country has as well. Um, but watching those results come in, it really impacted me because I knew what it, what the consequences could be like uh, for the LGBTQ community. And we're seeing some of that today in, in the cases at the, at the Supreme Court heard yesterday that John alluded to. Um, that next morning, I didn't make it to work, I think, until almost one o'clock. <laughs> and at the time, uh, Deborah Freitag, who's here in the, in the front row, and who's been a mentor to me and a friend, but also at that time was my manager, just got it and just sort of understood. So that being kind of a, a tough day for me to sort of accept what happened and understand how it could potentially Im impact things and seeing how that played out, I think that was just sort of this advocate moment and this element of understanding at a very human level that, hey, this is probably difficult on this person, and I'm going to sort of give them a break that they, they didn't come in this morning and I understand why. So you never know what moment an advocate or an ally can, is going to show up for you. But every time I've ever had it happen, I've been beyond thankful. So for those of you out there today in the room with us or listening on Zoom, if you're not a member of the LGBTQ community, but you're a supporter of equality and a supporter of inclusion, I hope that you'll come out as an ally and join us uh, in our efforts to really get to that place where coming out isn't a thing, because there's a lot to be achieved between that day and today. Thank you. Good stuff. Uh, so we've got uh, about 10 minutes for questions from the floor. We've got this little box thing we'll throw at you um, that's got a mic in it. So if you, uh, if you have a question, raise your hand and we'll get you, we'll get you the, uh, the mic box. And also taking questions on Zoom. As well as uh, who's got the Zoom feed? You've got the Zoom feed. Thank you. Questions for any of our, our esteemed panel here. John, throw me the ball, coach. All right. I love it. <laughs> uh, this question is uh, kind of for Stan first, but everyone. Uh, your experiences globally uh, with being, you know, an advocate, your position at IBM, uh, could you, you know, give us some uh, insight into that? Different, you know, especially the cultural differences. Yeah, the LGBT diversity and acceptance is, you know, widely varies all over the world. And there's some countries that, you know, it's very dangerous uh, to be out or to be gay. Uh, but IBM always took the position that uh, any IBMer within the walls of IBM is going to be respected and protected. And so we actually had, you know, employee resource groups, you know, start in Japan and India and throughout Latin America. And so, you know, we know that we can't actually change the laws of a country, but we can have impact on their people. Uh, one of the things that we did at IBM is we had a reverse mentoring setup where we had young out LGBT employees in, in Latin America uh, paired with senior executives who are older, who are very hesitant about LGBT to, to share their experiences with them and to give these executives a safe space to ask those questions so it moves the ball forward you know in the business world and hopefully these steps going these steps going forward you know in the business world these people can then the IBMers in those countries can start having an impact on society and showing them that having an inclusive country where all people can be valued and do their best is going to lead to the best economic results for that country another hand over on the side? No. Nope. Do we have any on Zoom? Any Zoom questions? Not yet. So um, just in case we had another question here. Um, has being out as an ally um, 
has being out as an ally or LGBTQ uh, person given you any special insight that you can leverage in the workplace? Well, one thing I can talk about is, you know, as, as a white male, you know, one of the things that I need to do, you know, is, is be an ally to, you know, other people at work. Uh, for example, when I do diversity training, you know, oftentimes it's more meaningful for white people to hear from me about systemic racism and about white privilege and some of those tough, uh, top, top, you know, tough subjects. They might not be open to a black person sharing it. Oh, that's just an angry black person that has an ax to grind. So sometimes it's important for an ally to speak on behalf of this group because they can sometimes, you know, I, you know, be listened to because I really don't have a stake in the game per se. And, uh, you know, I think that as being, you know, appreciating my allies, my LGBT allies, you know, means I can be a stronger ally to other communities, uh, women in the workplace, uh, people with disabilities, uh, people who are not from the U.S. and might be struggling with uh, English as their second language and supporting them and trying to uh, present a, a nurturing environment for them. And then also I did a workshop once called Your Issues Are My Issues that as an LGBT advocate, I have to realize that I have to care about other people's issues, like you know, uh, equal pay for women and the Me Too movement, that I have to care about the environment, that I have to care about economic justice, that if I'm gonna want allies to care about what I care about as an LGBT person, I really have to work hard and be allies to what all of your issues are out there. Yeah, I would have to ditto that, I mean, when my sibling came out in the 80s, it opened my eyes to social justice in general and that we all have a place in that. We, we have to stand up for anyone that's in the margins at any level. And, uh, you know, that's sort of been a, a quiet, and after 2016 has been a le much less quiet activity and, and activism on my part. I surely hope that it has, right? So for 20 years, we've created a culture at RegEd that is tr genuinely colorblind, genuinely blind to diversity, and to, uh, not blind to diversity. We're blind to anyone who's, who, who in, intolerant is a better word. We're intolerant of anyone who is intolerant about anything and in every way. And we just ran the numbers the other day and we're fit, Reggae is 51% female and the executive team is 50% female. Now, do I wish I had more diversity in terms, of, in terms of race throughout that? I certainly do. But, well, one, someone in the leadership team said, oh, well, we should try and get that higher. And I said, wait, that isn't the world 51% female? Like, I think we're doing really well. So I, 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 don't, I hope that, that that it's created within me being an out professional has created a sensitivity to me towards as everyone just up here has said towards any type of intolerance and has created a, an antipathy towards anything that would ever create something that was oppressive in any environment and have and, and allow that to exist and that's going on 20 years and at our firm we have of those 250 employees, we have probably 75 of them who have been with us for greater than 10 years. And it can't be because we pay the best and it can't be because of many things. And it surely isn't, um, it surely isn't because of me, John Schultz and Mishra will tell you that. It is more because I think we've created a culture there that is inclusive and welcoming regardless and is, I hope, a meritocracy in some ways, regardless of who we are. And the only other thing I would say, and we just had this conversation before is, you know, now we are on a gender fluidity and, 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 and trans path to making certain that our our queer brethren there have the same opportunity. And I'll tell you, I, I, the world wasn't wired that way even five years ago to think about these issues. And now they're for most in, in, in my mind because I know they're the same issues that I dealt with 30 years, 30 years earlier and, and trans people are dealing with them right now. So there's always gonna be opportunity to find new communities in need that, that require our support. I don't think there's much new to say on this topic. I think that these folks hit all the key points, but you know, it, it really is, I think, about a power balance. Um, whether you're looking at 
women in a minority group or black people or differently abled people or LGBTQ, it has to be a partnership with the folks on the other side. And to Stan's point, I think being an ally of other groups is so important. And having the perspective, gaining the perspective from being a part of the LGBT group, and uh, you know, as a as a woman in technology and a woman in leadership as well, it gives you those experiences to understand. You know, my my skin might not be black, but I can understand what it feels like to be part of a marginalized group. And because I understand what that feels like, I want to fight for those folks and I want to advocate for those folks. And I hope that they share that understanding as well and will advocate in return because it really will take um, all of us working together to achieve equality in the workplace, in our communities and in the world as a whole. So I looked at that, that last value in our core four values here at the Dude Up Together. Um, and that's what it's gonna take. And I hope, that, I hope that folks will come and be a part of this journey as we work towards that for LGBTQ community and for all of our uh, communities here at the Dude. So we have a question from online. It's a two-part question. Um, how can people get more involved as an ally and what are some tools, forums, or mechanisms that people can leverage to get more involved? So in, in terms of getting more involved as an ally here at the Dude, keep an eye out because we are launching the Pride Resource Group. It's going to be for members of the LGBTQ community, but it is for allies as well. So if you're talking about getting involved here at the Dude, keep an eye out for the more information that's going to come and raise your hand to be part of that group. Um, can you hit the second part of that question again, please? I lost it. Oh, is it not on? <laughs> oh, and where can people find more information? So yes, how can you find more information? Yeah. Before you leave here today, back by the snacks and drinks, we have a couple of printouts. One of them is a pamphlet to how can I be a better ally or how can I come out as an ally to the LGBTQ community. For folks in Grand Junction, Paulsbo, Olympia, and Toronto, we sent those resources to the, your champion. Um, each of the offices has a champion for this event that set up the viewing party go to those folks they have links to those resources we'll also send them out as a follow-up to today's event with the slides if you're interested in getting more connected to some of the statistics um and just just get informed i think that advocacy doesn't necessarily have to be a big organized event like a march or a rally or something like that it happens in the small moments that that take place day to day when you hear an offhanded remark or you hear somebody make a joke that's about a group and it's in those moments which are usually the toughest moments to also be an ally where you have to kind of stand up and speak and say, hey, you know what? That's not cool. How would you feel if you were part of that group or if your child was a part of that group or whatever it may be to just let folks know that they've, they've got to be a little bit more mindful and conscious of, of what they're saying and what's appropriate as a joke and, and what's not. And uh, one uh, really cool announcement is uh, there's a group about 30 uh, employee resource groups and companies that are supporting an effort called Pride in the Triangles LGBTQ Work Plus Equity Toolkit. It's going to be uh, rolling out in February and Dude Solutions is one of the corporate sponsors of that work. And what this is, is a toolkit to train ERG leaders to actually do workshops with employees in terms of how to be more empathetic, uh, what are the right terms and words to use, how to be a better ally, so hopefully uh, that'll be rolling out uh, in 2020 here at The Dude. This is super simple and kind of, if I, if I said this to my younger self, I would have cringed. But just like, you know, if there's a way for you to express your support for the community, like put this napkin on your desk, seriously. Like these kind of things, especially in, you know, if you don't live in New York, the, no, the awareness that someone is actually a proactive ally can mean an enormous amount to somebody who is, has any of those feelings that Nicole described from earlier in their career. So just letting people know, not just stopping bullying, but also just letting people know positively that you are an ally will undoubtedly have a beneficial effect. So, stay <laughs> We'll stick around Sorry, and talk to we'll work on the patience. Um, 
So I think we've seen solid evidence today that the LGBTQ plus inclusion is not only the right thing to do from a human interpersonal perspective, but it's also a business imperative. Um, a culture of equality creates trust, innovation, and therefore business growth. I wanna extend a big thank you today to our panelists who join us, to Ed for, for moderating, and to all of you as our audience uh, to be here this afternoon to kick off this really important conversation around LGBTQ inclusion at The Dude. I also wanna extend a special thanks to Dennis and Miles and Corporate IT. They did a lot of work helping get this all set up. And Lauren Clapper and Hannah Hinson from the Diversity and Inclusion Committee were also doing a ton of work behind the scenes to bring this event together today. My hope is that today serves as the first step on our journey to building a more inclusive Dude Nation. And I'd love to reach a place, I would truly love to reach a place where every dude, every single employee becomes a member of the Pride Resource Group, if not as a member of the LGBTQ community itself, as an ally, which is what we've just been talking about for the last few minutes. Um, it's going to take all of us working together. And I, 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 you know, let's work together to build and nurture that kind of culture where diverse perspectives can come together. It's going to inform improve decision making and stimulate innovation, which is really all fundamental to our goals and where we're trying to go as a company. Um, that's what's going to allow us to unlock the potential of all dudes and it is our people that are going to power our results and, and where we go as a team. So with that, I want to thank you and wish everybody a great afternoon. We have some snacks and drinks and information back by the lunch kiosk and I hope you'll all stick around to enjoy some of that and chat with anyone. Thanks for being here today. Have a great afternoon.